Hello, uh, my name is Nicole Millett. I am one of the leaders of the OCB Working Group on Mixotrophs and Mixotrophy, uh, one of the new working groups this year. And I'll be providing you a little bit of information about what this working group is, what we're looking at, and getting people ready for uh, a discussion to have on June 18th at 3.15 p.m. So first we have to start off by defining exactly what is a mixotroph, at least how this working group defines it. And so to be very clear, um, a mixotroph is a plankton that uses phototrophy or photosynthesis and phagotrophy, specifically the ingestion of prey through grazing to acquire nutrients to grow and reproduce. Um, and this distinction of phagotrophy versus osmosis in defining mixotrophs is really important. Osmotrophy can be very, very important in a lot of phytoplankton species, uh, but in order to make mixotrophs a distinct group, it helps to exclude the ability to do osmotrophy from the definition of what a mixotroph is. So a lot of mixotrophs can do osmotrophy, but it's not a requirement to be defined as a mixotroph, to be clear. Uh, our working group's goals. Um, first, we're really looking to set out to understand what are the most pressing research questions related to mixotrophy at this time. So getting people together, having a lot of discussions and seeing where a lot of the interest is, a lot of intersecting fields. Um, and what people are thinking about related to mixotrophy. And then from there, after we develop these guidelines, go back, or not, sorry, not these guidelines, once we develop these research questions, go back and develop guidelines for how to use methods to study um, these research questions. So first look at the current methods we have available and see which ones can be applied to address which questions and how best to use them. And then also see where there's current major gaps of questions that can't really be addressed well with our current methods and identify new methods for advancing this research. And we're definite, we're, we're particularly interested in um, in situ studies, so methods that can be developed to study mixed tropes in the natural environment. So why should people at OCB care about uh, mixotrophs? Well, they really, really mess with our understanding of the cycling of a lot of nutrients or biogeochemistry cycling. The best way to look at this is that they kind of short circuit the plankton food web. So what we have here, of course, is your very basic NPZ model. You have your phytoplankton here that are doing the role are filling the role of turning inorganic nutrients into organic nutrients and then they're consumed by zooplankton and all of that new organic nutrients are now moving up the food web. However, when you introduce mixotrophs into the picture, you have this group that they're not strictly at the primary level where nutrients is only entering into the food web at that stage. Uh, they're also taking existing organic matter and repackaging it like a grazer as well as producing new nutrients and so this can really improve trophic transfer because the transfer of nutrients from one group to the next is very inefficient a lot is lost through a wide range of processes but these mixotrophs can help make up for this inefficient transfer by creating new organic matter through photosynthesis and then, of course, uh, when you're changing the flow of carbon up the food web, you're also changing the flow of carbon down um, to be sequestered in the oh, deep ocean um, via the biological pump. So a better way to look at this um, is through um, some work that uh, Ben Ward and Mick Follows did uh, with the, the Darwin model, uh, a, global, a global model for open ocean uh, biogeochemistry and plankton functional groups. So with the model that they ran, they had all of these different uh, size classes and just looking um, and in one version of the model run, um, these size classes were either strictly autotrophs or strictly heterotrophs. And in a second model run, all of these different size classes were mixotrophs to varying degrees that the models assigned them essentially. 
So this here is the distribution of the global carbon biomass in each of these size classes when no mixotrophs were present. And then with the addition of mixotrophs, you can see that there's this real shift towards larger sized species. And again, the reason for that goes back to the fact that at these larger species where you typically don't see photosynthesis or strict autotrophs, you only, they're only getting carbon from ingesting smaller prey items. But with mixotrophs being present in these larger groups, that means that they're able to get um, organic carbon through photosynthesis. So you get a lot more uh, biomass being stored in these larger size classes, as well as more efficient trophic transfer. And when you have larger size classes of plankton, you have enhanced export to the deep ocean. So what this figure here shows is we've got this access along here. This is also, I should mention, from the word and follows work. You've got the a mixotrophic fraction of global carbon biomass. Uh, so here you've got higher fractions of mixotrophs in the global biomass. And then here is the amount of carbon that's being exported relative to the model run where there was no mixotrophy. And as you've got more uh, mixotrophic in the biomass, more mixotrophs in the biomass, you have more carbon export occurring. So now that we see, now that I've explained here that mixotrophs are really altering the flow of carbon, I'm sure a lot of people out there are going, yes, we need to be considering these mixotrophs, we need to be incorporating them into models and doing all this work with them, which is true, but there's still this question of when do we need to consider mixotrophs? When and where are there actually so many mixotrophs that our understanding of this you know, strict autotrophs and strict heterotrophs breaks down because there aren't always mixotrophs dominating the, the plankton community. There's still times where you've got your autotrophs and your heterotrophs and they're doing what we've always thought they were doing. And here um, from work done by Aditi Mitra, it's been suggested or it's been hypothesized that mixotrophs tend to um, dominate in more mature environments or more stable environments. And these mature environments are associated with highly stratified waters with very low nutrient concentrations. And so this succession here is a really good demonstration of the kind of uh, annual plankton succession you see in temperate oceans. So over here, you've got a huge influx of um, inorganic nutrients, usually in the form of nitrite, sorry, nitrate, uh, nitrate, and you get a lot of diatoms in response to that. But then as these diatoms take up all of the nitrate, the overall concentrations of nutrients are going down, and now you're getting a lot more recycled nutrients and not these new nutrients coming in. And so then you're transitioning into these mature environments that are more stable. And what takes over are these diatom, sorry, these dinoflagellates and these ciliates, which are largely considered mixotrophs. Uh, so a common place where you see a lot of these mature environments on a regular basis are open ocean gyres, where there's not a lot of turnover happening environments are largely stable, very low nutrient concentrations, a lot of recycled nutrients, and as a result, very low plankton concentrations as well. So within these open ocean gyres, we see um, a high percentage of the bacteria is attributed to mixotrophs. So this is a percentage of protist bacteria, and these two groups here are your mixotrophs. And so in a lot of these different environments, over 50% of the bacteria is attributed to mixotrophs. And this is very important to keep in mind because these types of regions are thought to be expanding as we move into more, seeing more impacts of climate change. And the last thing here that I want to stress, so just to recap, mixotrophs really alter the flow of carbon. Um, and there's definitely certain environments that are thought to favor mixotrophs over others, and we need to do better to understand need to do a better job of understanding that. But I've been speaking of mixotrophs so far as a large, single large group 
a large functional group. But that's just not the case. Uh, mixotrophs can uh, be divided into many groups. Uh, the first main division that exists is between a, a group of constitutives versus non-constitutives. So these constitutives over here, you can see they've got green arrows because these are the group that have their own chloroplasts. So their primary source of nutrients is through photosynthesis and they supplement with prey ingestion. These non-constitutives, they do not have their own chloroplasts. Some can obtain them by stealing them from their prey, and sometimes they have an endosymbiotic relationship with phytoplankton that they cultivate inside of them. And then you can see within each of these, um, underneath the, both of these groups, there's all of these other sub sub groups. And so there's a lot of different types of functional groups of mixotropes, which are going to be transforming nutrients in different ways compared to the other. And they're also going to dominate under different conditions and have different kinds of impact on carbon and other nutrients cycling. So mixotrophs need to be more than just mixotrophs. And so looking ahead, this is one of the big things, um, at least with interest related to OCB, is understanding how these different groups of mixotrophs impact biogeochemical cycling and then how to go on incorporating this into models. So how many groups of mixotrophs do we really need to consider when we're modeling? So that's a quick overview of mixotrophs some biogeochemistry things interest related to OCB and um, hopefully you'll stick around for a little bit longer as I give a bit more information directly related to events that are happening with our working group. So of course just a reminder we have our event at the OCB summer session on June 18th 3:15 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We have also do a lot of these virtual events that are open for anyone to come to. And our next virtual event is scheduled for July 12th. And the topic of discussion for that event is biogeochemistry of mixotrophs, um, the observational side of that. And we've got talks scheduled by Dr. Solange Dumal and Dr. Tristan Beard. And then in September, on September 13th, we have um, continuing discussions of biogeochemistry of mixotrophs coming at it from a modeling side and the speakers uh, will hopefully be announced soon for that. And then November 15th we're looking at biogeography of mixotrophs and then we've got some other ideas um, for the coming year as well as we continue these sessions and also we we um, should be having a scientific session at OSM 2022 we'll be soliciting abstracts for so if you've got anything related to mixotrophy you want to talk about at OSM please look for our session and so these virtual meetings that I'm talking about what exactly do they look like so uh, if you haven't picked up on the pattern they occur the second Tuesday of every other month and they go for 90 minutes starting at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and the way these are formatted is there's two presenters they get about 10 20 minutes each kind of present their their idea of the specific theme for that meeting and then we break out into discussion groups and people discuss specific questions put forward by our speakers. And then we wrap back up as a full group and discuss what each group talked about and then kind of compile it all together and see where where we feel about the, the ideas that have been presented for that specific theme. And so just to reiterate, these meetings are open for all and they're usually advertised through OCB. So feel free to um, to attend them when you see them announced. Um, also feel free to recommend a topic for one of the meetings. Like I said, we've got some other ideas in the works, but we really want these dis discussions to be driven by what other people want to hear about. And then also down here, this is our website on the OCB uh, site for our working group. And so you'll find a lot of updates through there as well.
And now we have a final question for you. So hopefully you're not watching this immediately before our session on June 18th. Um, but if you've got just a couple hours to think about it, how do you think your work or methods could interface with mixotrophs or mixotrophy? So just the kind of things that you study, how might they be influenced or impacted if you were to take mixotrophs into consideration? And what, what methods might you be able to apply to, to see if mixotrophs are having an impact? So thank you for listening to this short little talk and we hope to see as many people as possible at our session.